The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So today I'd just like to cover in fair amount of detail how to how to gather data and then uh, analyze it for the elastic modulus experiment that we'll do. And this parallels a pretty standard measurement that's done with standard AFM. So what I'll do is kind of describe the two sides of it, standard AFM and ours. Um, and hopefully that'll make a little bit clearer how our force curves differ um, and what, what kind of information you're looking to get. So uh, those of you who've used standard AFM know that a typical force curve looks like this. And I'll do the uh, approach and retract sections in different colors. And there may be also a small jump to contact here. OK, so that represents the approach out of contact and then the linear displacement of the cantilever. And this is the uh, uh, photodiode, positional photodiode that will detect this, the reflected spot. Okay, so standard optical lever setup. And uh, if you look at what happens with substrates of different hardness, you will just see the slope of this line. So this is. Uh, the readout will be in volts, but typically this, this axis is converted to Z, which is piezo deflection or piezo motion. And most software will do this automatically for you, um, but there's a, there's a calibration going on there. So you have to relate the piezo motion to whatever the voltage of the, uh, is being applied to the piezo or somehow being read into the AFM. So the relationship between piezo motion to displacement of the, of the spot on the photodiode, it then gives you a conversion factor for basically nanometers per volt of displacement. Okay? And that slope for different, uh, for different materials, you'll see a different slope. Typically, if you have a softer material, uh, the slope will get smaller, something like this, from the contact point. I'm being a little bit quick about my drawing. But the idea is simply that a material that's compliant that you're going to be indenting with the probe will, uh, as the stage moves, it'll deflect the cantilever less than it would if the material were hard. So the difference between um, the difference between the motion of the stage and uh, the indentation of the cantilever will give you the the actual distance through which the material has been indented. Okay, does that make sense? So let me say that again. Our first curve, assuming we do this first, first curve on a hard material, is sort of a direct measure of the, the mov movement of the stage. Okay? If, uh, if we have an independent way of measuring the stage motion, which in, again, in a standard AFM typically you do, you have, a, you have a piezo that is well calibrated and you have an independent measurement of stage motion, then that's your kind of calibration factor for how much you're moving this, uh, sorry, that's your calibration standard for how much you're moving the stage. And then the cantilever deflection is a separate signal that you're comparing. Okay? In our case, you'll see that there's a subtle difference, which is why I'm trying to emphasize this point. Okay? And so uh, in a very simple experiment, what we just want to do is find out the amount by which the substrate is being indented by the AFM probe tip. And that is simply the difference between how much the stage has moved and how much the cantilever has bent. Distance, uh, the distance between those two. Okay, so if we draw now the force curve that our AFM generates, I'm just going to use the same colors. So red is going to be the approach. We'll have some out of contact section, and I'm going to assume our bias is set as we like it to the middle of the uh, of the sine squared. So we're going to start following this sinusoid, okay? And then as we retract, 
we've seen that there's oftentimes some sticking, so we'll follow this curve back out again. There's sometimes a little bit of hysteresis. Anyway, we'll get back to somewhere, and then we'll come back like this. Okay. So if we now, if we think carefully about this point of contact, the equivalent to having a smaller slope on this, uh, in this situation, the equivalent is to stretch out this sine squared to make the period of it longer. And that actually, if you look at just this contact point, a smaller slope, it will be exactly what you'll see. So this curve will start with a smaller slope, and then it'll just have a much slower period. Okay. So again, comparing to this situation, what we're going to be looking for is the difference between the stage movement and the amount that the cantilever bends in order to determine how far we've indented our sample. And that, that distance will be what we'll use to calculate the elastic modulus of it. And, th and again, there's a, there's a subtle difference between these calculations because it's a little bit harder to interpret the numerical data out of this curve since it's nonlinear compared to this curve. So the easiest way to do this experiment is to keep the bias the same between your measurements and to try to measure to a known point on the curve. Okay? Now, we know, uh, we know the following. We know that if we use a hard sample, uh, well, no sample is infinitely hard. <laughs> Um, if we use a sample that is relatively hard compared to what the, the samples of interest that we're trying to measure, which in this case, we're, we're going to use silicon nitride. Um, that is, has the same hardness as our cantilever material, and it's going to indent very little compared to the polymer samples we're going to measure later. So we'll, we'll assume that that sample is ideally hard and does not indent at all. And that'll provide us with that reference, which we talked about here, the, the, uh, the stage motion. Okay, so we want to be able to determine what, uh, what measurement along this axis of our output uh, relates to certain nanometers of displacement of the stage. Okay? So that first measurement on the hard sample will give us that. And then, once, and then when we switch to measuring the softer samples, we can still use that same uh, stage motion as a reference value, and then we're simply measuring the cantilever deflection, right? So in this, again, the difference is in this system, we have only one thing that we can measure. We don't have a calibrated piezo. We don't have a reference to which we can say, okay, we know the stage is moving exactly this far. But since we've done that once on the hard sample, we can assume that that holds true throughout the other measurements. And when we make the other measurements, we can then measure the cantilever deflection for the softer samples and compare that to the previous value and subtract it to get the indentation. OK? So in order, to, uh, in order to measure this in a known way, the, the, the part about this calibration curve that we know we've discussed already a number of times is that this distance from peak to trough Okay, that represents, again, when you're using the hard sample, so I'm only talking about the case where the sample does not indent at all. This represents a stage motion of 160 approximately, 160 nanometers, uh, which is a quarter of the laser wavelength. And that's, again, remember this is only true at the fingers. You have to make a correction for the tip location. So, once we know that, this, and then this is going to equal some number of volts. So say this is 2 volts. Okay? So now you have a calibration factor to convert the volts you see on the x-axis to nanometers of motion. Note that not always is go it's not always going to be possible to measure it precisely by a peak and a trough. So you can make other equal size seg take other equal size segments of the sine squared curve, such as from midpoint to midpoint. And you'll see that in reality, when the sine squared amplitude varies because of the non-idealities of the grading, so you might, you might be going, one, the first fringe might be this high, and the second fringe might only be that high. And so then it becomes a little bit harder. So the key is to try to choose points where you know what that displacement value is. Peak and trough are really good, but not always possible, and especially if you're um, if you're biased to the middle, 
the next midpoint is actually a really good place, and oftentimes you get the very nice clean curve for that first half wavelength or so. Okay. Um, so let me just draw this sort of as a close-up. And you have, um, you have a picture of this in your lab manual again, but I'm going to just go over it a little more carefully. So I'm just drawing the first fringe for a few different samples. OK. So the easiest calculation to make is basically to find the difference between this spacing. Sorry, wrong color, actually. OK, so as I mentioned before, the purple curve is your reference, the hard surface. That represents the stage motion. And then the red curve. So now you'll see that you've had to make a larger stage motion to achieve the same cantilever deflection. OK, so it, it, here we have to move the stage a certain amount, and we've bent our cantilever through one half of its full cycle. And here we have to move the stage this much further in order to bend the cantilever to the same degree. So that is, that is the difference uh, that we're looking for. That's the indentation of the sample. And the other uh, numerical parameter you'll have to calculate is what is the force that you're applying with the cantilever at that point. And so again, that, that uh, lambda over 4 becomes the key, key metric there, because now you know that uh, you've bent the cantilever through a known known distance, and if you know the spring constant, you know the force. So that, I think, is enough belaboring. Now we should get to uh, actually measuring. Uh, so now I'll, I'll just talk about the cantilever geometry correction factor that, uh, uh, that plays into the numerical calculation of how much the cantilever actually bends. So, uh, whenever we talk about cantilever bending, we're always interested in what's going on at the tip. Um, and in all of our cantilevers, the interdigitated fingers are located some distance away, uh, usually about halfway back towards the root of the cantilever. And so this is a little diagram of how the cantilever is actually bending away from its equilibrium straight position. And what you can see is that there's, there's this is obviously exaggerated, but there's a, a certain curve to the cantilever, and the distance here that you see. So this is, this is the nominal deflection that you measure with the interdigitated grating right here. OK, this is, uh, we're going to call this psi, I think, is the variable that's used for it in the, in the lab manual. Um, and that distance is different than the actual distance that the tip is moving. So we, we need a correction factor that accounts for this and says, OK, if we have a certain deflection here, what's, what's going to be the case here? And for that, there's, there's two kind of one easy way and one slightly less easy way to do it. Um, obviously, the cantilever does not stay a straight beam. If, you, if, it, if it did, you would just use a linear equation to fit it. The actual true bent shape of the cantilever is best represented by a third order equation, and, and it's described in your lab manual. I'll show you the quadratic case, because that's an easy way to um, estimate it, just kind of back of the envelope without having to get an exact number. Essentially, um, if you assume that the cantilever assumes a quadratic shape, then whatever distance you have here, the ratio of this length to, to this length, um, I believe it's m in your lab manual. Let me just check what variables we use. Yeah, so MID is defined as the total length, sorry, the ID distance to the total length, which is 
This is LID here. And LT is the total length of the cantilever. Okay. And you'll notice that this variable is a little bit uh, poorly characterized because this diffraction grating has a fairly long extent. And you can position your laser beam in a number of different places on the diffraction grating and still get valid diffractive modes. So that's one of the main, um, main difficulties with making the measurement precise. So you want to position that beam in a way that you can estimate its position best. So if you choose one edge of the diffraction grating, that'll give you, say, maybe 20 micron accuracy. Um, so using that ratio, if you, just, if you assume that the beam has a quadratic shape, then you just take this ratio and square it to get the ratio of how far this is deflecting compared to the tip. And if you want to be a little bit more precise, you can use the uh, equation given in, um, in the lab manual, which is a slightly more complicated functional form. But the essence of the, uh, of the correction is what I've described. So does that, uh, does that make the issue clear? Good. OK. Alrighty then. So now um, we can get to measuring. Um, the samples are Let me just show the samples. So the samples are in this box. They're all kind of jammed together. And uh, if you try to keep them spatially roughly where they are, they won't get mixed up. <laughs> um, in the middle, there's just the bare silicon nitride. And you'll see they just don't have any PDMS on top. And then uh, this is, I believe, the soft PDMS. And this is the harder PDMS. But I can't remember exactly. But just note which side you took your PDMS from, and everything should be OK. I believe, yeah, I believe that's correct. OK. And then the cantilevers that we'll be using are, well, I'll, I should be able to give you the right box. Again, the labels are kind of fading. But uh, it's the shortest beams, imaging, levers. No, here they are. Modulus levers, 250 micron. So these will, be, these will be the same shape that you saw yesterday, long middle beam, short side beams. But the whole thing is about 250 microns in length. So uh, there will be, be more angular aberration because the beams are shorter. And so it presents its own little challenge. Which I guess we'll cover. Yes. All right.